My life has been made up of defining moments. I was born into a predominantly Dutch lineage. I had, at one time, about five generations alive until I was nine years old, if you can imagine. Pretty proud of that heritage. We stem back to Holland and the Netherlands, and um, that, that has played a significant role in my life later on. When I was seven years old, my parents and I were living in Montana, and I attended the Little Brown Church of Big Fork, Montana. And I had a blessed experience when my pastor's wife walked into our Sunday school class and told us that Jesus died on the cross, he came back to life, and he was coming again. And with the faith of a child, I was born again right there on the spot, very simply. No aisle, no baptism, nothing, just believing. It was during that time, though, that I was to face my first true trial as a believer. So many times we believe when we're saved, we're not supposed to face any difficulties, and basically we kind of skip into heaven and everything's fine, and the Lord doesn't allow us to go through any trials. But biblically speaking, that's simply not true. And very shortly after my salvation, I experienced my first devastating moment. My grandparents had driven across the country to uh, come and visit us from Nebraska. And I remember being in the bedroom and my grandmother was helping me pack my suitcase. And uh, we said goodbye to my dad as my mom and I got in the car with them. And I saw my dad walk down the stairs into the basement and had no idea that that was my mom and me leaving. We were leaving my dad. And shortly thereafter, a divorce ensued. And that truly was probably the first defining moment of my life. After that, it really, that made the difference. I had a lot of issues with panic and anxiety and I had uh, some very serious issues with an obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders. I had hangups that I couldn't explain. And so much of it was because of a sudden abrupt change. I'm not sure anybody ever really explained that this was a divorce, but I knew something was very different. I was very blessed though, because what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. I was always in church. My mother made sure that I was in church, as her mother did, and her mother, and so on. And I was baptized and had a life-changing experience in my hometown church. At eight, I was introduced to a name that has stuck with me all of my life, Corey Ten Boom of The Hiding Place. This book was passed around of her story, and I remember her face on the front cover. What would an eight-year-old have in common with the Nazis and Hitler in concentration camps? I really can't explain what that was, but God inscribed that story on my heart, and it, it truly made an impact on me at a very young age. Fast forward several years, I had a, a blessed experience in a youth group. The one thing I noticed, though, in my walk with God, as I overcame a lot of these panic problems and anxiety and became an overcomer, I was missing something. There was a depth of something that I had seen in other believers in my youth group, these kids that had before and after stories already, and they were just in high school. They had what I called fire, and I was missing this fire, which I didn't even know what fire was. I just knew that was the word, and I had no idea that was in God's word, the word fire. But I was missing that passion and that zeal that they had. Later on, when I was about 27, I had been working in a bar, working my way through school. I had fallen away from the Lord and had struggled through the years with an absent father. I saw him once a year, and a lot of dynamics take place in a young girl when she doesn't have the complete family life. They say divorce doesn't really affect kids so much, some more than the others, but really there's this thing that we think kids are resilient and that they'll bounce back. I really wasn't one of those. I didn't really bounce back. I had to learn that the Lord God was my father, regardless of the father I had on this earth. And through a miserable search during that time in school when I was working in this bar, I remember feeling there had to be more to this walk with God than this. I kept saying to myself, there has to be more. I want that fire I saw with my youth group. And as God would have it, I began to search churches. My cousin invited me to a church that he was attending brand new in Atlanta, Snellville First Baptist Church. And I walked in and heard Dr. Merritt preach. And within a few months, he looked down at the congregation and I was sitting in the very back row 
like a good Baptist girl, back row Baptist I was, and he said, if you've been visiting this church for several months, you need to join right now. And I thought, who told him? Somebody reporting this to him? And within a matter of weeks, I had joined the church and I felt very obligated to follow through in obedience for whatever reason he said it from the pulpit. I was introduced to the TV ministry and began an interest in media. And through that, I was introduced to an incredible, another defining moment in my life with a women's ministry. I met Jerry Sisk, who is probably the foremost, most influential woman in my life. Within a matter of a few weeks of meeting her and sitting under her teaching, I was introduced to a uh, conference that was coming up. And the speaker there was Pam Rosewell Moore. And incidentally, she was going to speak on her experience working with Corey Ten Boom of The Hiding Place. I walked into that sanctuary that morning, completely frustrated. I had schoolwork due and I was about to graduate and I had no clue what I was going to do when I grew up. I was just searching for answers. I didn't have the kind of shaping from a strong parental home with my mom and my dad there. And I was such a free spirit that Really, it was hard to harness my energy that God had given me this inner desire and drive to do things. So I was searching for what to do. At 27, that's not exactly 17, you know, that's, that's getting up there in life and I really felt like I should have been in my career by then. Pam opened her mouth the first session of that women's conference and for the very first time, I heard God's voice. Nobody had to tell me that was Him. And I heard him say, paraphrased Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse I didn't even know then at the time. And all he said to me was, I have a plan for your life. And that basically redefined everything of life as I knew it. I went home that night and I made a full, complete commitment to follow the Lord. I, I left the bar scene, I was, <clears throat> really at wit's end to know what direction to go to next, but I knew at that moment the Lord had something in mind if He told me He had a plan. I didn't know God had plans for us. All of a sudden, all the angst and the worry and the confusion and the drive to have a career left me because now I got to figure out what He wanted instead of what I thought I should do or anybody else that told me what I should do. I had new eyes. The sky was a different color, the grass was a different color, the music sounded different, and I was filled with joy. And you want to talk about fire? God delivered. I was on fire. And ever since that moment of 1995 in April, the joy of the Lord has overflowed in my life. I call it the Mark chapter 8 second touch when Jesus was healing the man in Bethesda. He touched him the first time and he could see men walking like trees and Jesus touched him again and then the man said, now I see clearly. I could see men walking like trees for years, I just didn't have a depth of a walk with God, but now I could see clearly. And shortly after that I was introduced to business, I became an entrepreneur and God did some things in my life I never dreamed of in my interest in media. It was during a very difficult betrayal later on, again another defining moment, that I had to learn how to overcome and not focus on the church or leadership or people. I had to completely depend on the Lord for my identity. When a betrayal takes place in a church, oftentimes people leave. They don't want to hang around. They think that churches needs to be labeled Ichabod and they're very quick to retreat. And I knew that if I did that, I would miss on some of the greatest blessings of my life. And God helped me learn how to forgive. If His Son could die and hang on a cross naked for me, despising the shame, and He could look down on me with blood dripping from His face onto mine is how I envision it. And He said, I, I'm doing this just for you. How could I point and look at someone else and say, I can't forgive them? So I learned the ultimate lesson my defining moment of forgiveness. The Lord very quickly ushered me into a very interesting place where I am now. That name, The Hiding Place, came up again. I was uh, on the internet one day and I had learned a great deal about the internet and social media and marketing and publicity and television and radio and had stepped into an area I always dreamed of. And I looked up that name 
Pam Rosewell Moore, the lady who worked with Corey Ten Boom and spoke at that conference 17 years before that. I emailed her and she answered me back. And next thing I knew, I was serving in the ministry by her invitation with her. I was introduced to a sequel film called Return to the Hiding Place and was asked to be the publicist, which to this day I'm astounded that God would put me in that very story that he planted in my heart when I was eight years old. It dawned on me one day that through this whole thing, God had shown me 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, when Elisha was confronted by the widow who said, help, I'm in debt, I need help. They're about to take my children to pay off my debt. And Elisha said, what do you have? And she said, nothing but a pot of oil. And he said, then go gather vessels from all your neighbors and take them into your home. And so she did. And he told her to start pouring that oil. And as God would have it, he multiplied that oil. And she was able to pay off her debt and love off the rest. That passage became the mantra of my life. I discovered that in this new realm of ministry, what my job was, was to more or less help others find their oil and teach them how to submit it unto the Lord, that gift, that skill set, that story they have, whatever it is in their life that they can use as a ministry or to monetize or whatever God would use that for, and to point that out in their life and help them. Not that I would ever compare it to Elisha, but that was the role God gave me. I asked him, what do you want me to do? And he said, help others find their oil. So my ministry is now the oil ministry. And through that, I've helped others like Pam and our women's ministry director of the church that influenced me so much, my mother, other strong women and men in my life, and I've taught them how to multiply their oil. God has been very good to me, and I praise His name and have praised Him ever since.